Russell Blackford, good to see you. Good to see you, Dan. Good uh, morning here. Good evening there. Um, welcome to everyone in the uh, Sophia audience, the Meaning of Life TV, Blogginghead.tv audience. Um, this is the Sophia program available on streaming uh, video and audio podcast. My name is Daniel Kaufman. I'm the host. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. I also uh, publish and edit a magazine online called The Electric Agora. I am very pleased to be here with uh, Russell Blackford, the author of The Tyranny of Opinion. Could you show it to us, please? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, which came out in 2018 on Bloomsbury Press. Um, I will give full disclosure, um, despite the fact that no one will be surprised by the fact that I agree with Russell about pretty much everything, but I, I was asked to do the blurb on the back of the book, and I also was asked to do a review of the book, which I gave a very positive review to, but just so that people know um, where things stand. Um, Russell, will you tell the audience a little bit, in philosophy, everybody knows who you are, and um, um, and you are becoming a pretty, I think, prominent public intellectual, but for people in the audience who don't know, could you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm not sure they do know who I am in philosophy, but um, I'm glad that you think I so. Did. I, <laughs> I, I, I Okay, well, I hope there's some truth to that. <laughs> Look, I've, I've had a fairly crazy career because I've, you know, I've been a public servant, I've been a lawyer. Um, I, you know, I have a background in government, in public policy, whatever. I've never really been a career academic, although I have done a lot of you know, what we call sessional teaching here. And I have an honorary position, senior, senior lecturer, which is about equivalent to an associate professor, I suppose, um, here at an Australian university, the University of Newcastle. So, yeah, I have a background in academia, but my, my larger background is really in law and, and public policy and, and government. What were the circumstances? So, you you had a government career and a law career. When did the PhD get done and all of that sort of stuff? You know, when I was young, I did have ambitions to be in the world of academia, and it kind of wasn't the right timing. I, I was kind of around in the early eighties, just as things were going very badly in academia internationally. Uh, with, I mean. You're slightly younger than me, I think. You might not remember those days, but those were just the days when Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan were you know, acting away with education where things were retreating pretty badly in academia. And in fact, Australia was flooded with American and, and British academics that were kind of refugees from, from Reagan and Thatcher. So Although I had some you know, minor career in academia way back there, it, it, it really didn't work out. It was a very, very difficult time. And it was from there that I went into the public service and was quite successful in the, in the public service, wherever that's worth. And things have moved on from there. But as I've got older, I've, I've tended to rebound a bit into academia. I have two PhDs for my sins. You know, wow. One's in English literature, the other's in in philosophy, though my topic was a kind of bioethics topic, but kind of bioethics, kind of some philosophy of law. And what was your, what was your lit dissertation in? Uh, I'm trying to think of the exact title, but it was something about the return to myth in, you know, in, in certain modern fiction. I was interested in the literary theory of Northrop Frye, and I was interested in applying that to the, the fiction of the time. This, again, is back in the early 80s. So I have that kind of background in, you know, in the – it's sort of some background literary theory and you know, mythography and what have you. But, but a lot of my work in philosophy is very much imbued my, my background in law and government. You know, I think that, that in theory should give me some kind of edge, though I don't know that it's seen that way in academia more generally. Now, when you say public service, did you, did you actually run for elected office or did you work in the bureaucracy? No, I mean as a, as a career public servant, you know, someone in the civil service or whatever. Gotcha. You want to call it, yeah. Gotcha. Um, well, we're here today to discuss the book. Um, and, um, you know, maybe this is not fortunate, but I suspect that this book is going to remain relevant for quite some time because I don't see us getting out of the scenarios that it sort of uh, is concerned with anytime mm. soon. For about two seconds, I thought the coronavirus might – break us of this this weird spell that we're in but i'm after the second pass i realized that there's absolutely no chance of that happening um 
maybe you could talk a little bit about what the central um, th- what the central aim is of the book, and what was it that that led you to to, to think you needed to do it. Yeah, look, the book is subtitled "Conformity in the Future of Liberalism," right? And and the book is largely in praise of nonconformity. You know, it, it's largely in praise of the kind of things that John Stuart Mill was in praise of all those years ago, 150, 160 years ago. So I'm arguing for the, you know, the freedom of the individual, not just against state power, but against the, you know, the pressures that come from society as a whole. So, so, so it's a traditional kind of liberal view, not liberal in the American sense of a, and a political tradition going back to Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s, which is all about government you know, regulation of the economy, but liberalism in the larger sense. And when I'm talking about the future of liberalism, I, I, you know, I'm worried about the future of liberalism. I, I think our, we see a lot of forces in society, a lot of them now coming from the left, in addition to those that have always come from the right, which erode liberalism in that sense, you know, which tend to erode our freedom not to conform, tend to erode our, our practical freedom of speech, tend to erode the, the sort of practical uh, liberty we have. I keep saying practical because, I, again, I'm not fetishising the power of government. I, I, I do worry about the power of government. But as Mill did, I, you know, I worry about the much wider pressures to conform that we see around us. And I'm very worried what I suppose you say what motivated it. A lot of it motive, a lot, a lot of what motivated it was the kind of pressure I see increasingly from the left of politics, which is where I kind of have my being. You know, I've, I've never been a creature of the right. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a radical leftist. I've never been a Marxist, but I've always been you know, a social democrat. I've always been you know, somewhere at least within the centre left. But the kind of discourse and pressure that I in- increasingly have seen, particularly over the last ten years, you know, really worries me. I mean, we can think of all sorts of examples of that. There are a lot of examples in the book of where you know, people have said what's been thought to be the wrong thing and suddenly they're monstered. They become the subject of a you know, Twitter hashtag. There are you know, pressures to have them fired from their jobs. All, all kinds of things happen to them. And often these people are themselves people who are at least to some extent on the left or at least in some sense liberal and yet they... You know, they, they, they come under these pressures. So who am I talking about? Well, the example of, um, of Erica and Nicholas Christakis at Yale a few years ago is one example where Erica Christakis said something fairly innocuous about not wanting to be the person to decide what Halloween costumes students are allowed to use. You know, next thing there's this enormous outcry. A very yeah, memorable and, video of, of a bizarre kind of almost yeah. public meltdown um, on the part of students, yeah. There's an incredible confrontation of her husband, you know, Nicholas Christakis, um, by you know, a very large number, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 students who, who literally have him you know, surrounded, unable to move, and, you know, and again, quite literally in his face shouting at him. You know, really quite incredible footage. So that's one example, but there are many, many other examples and I think this is quite frightening. You know, we've, we've reached a point where a lot of people out there in society who wield, you know, some kind of power, if it's only the kind of power to raise a mob, you know, will react so harshly to anything that is at all in dissent from the kind of view that they approve of. Yeah. So let me ask you, I'm going to, let me, let me ask you to sort of reply to what sort of, you know, the, the standard sort of thing that I'm hearing um, um, when people do express concerns about about this sort of thing, um, you you get a variety of replies from those who are not who are not inclined to accept the idea. One is you get yeah. the nothing to see here sort of reply, which I, I'm 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 happy to just sort of um, um, leave to the side. But you do get a somewhat of a more substantive, thoughtful reply, and that is sort of like well. What we're seeing now is finally the floodgates opening after people who had been kept down too long and who had been silenced too long and who had been subjected to, in a sense, 
the authority of these power structures for too long are now finally getting to have their say. And, um, um, boo hoo to you that you don't like it. Um, but, but, um, but, uh, you know, in other, in other words, that this is a kind of a long simmering comeuppance that now is just happening to burst and that we should almost be glad for it because now finally these sort of powerless now are finding their okay. voice and the new media, which you do talk about and which I hope we'll talk about has made it easier for them to sort of push back. What is your reply to that sort of um, response yeah. when it's intended in good faith, of course? I mean, well, sometimes well, it's when it's intended in good faith and when it's spelled out in some yeah. detail, it is a fairly complex response and any response to it would also have to be complex. I, you know, I, I don't want to denigrate the idea that there are groups who've been historically disadvantaged and have historically been unable to, to have their say. That seems uncontestable, I, actually. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, that's all true. And as I said, I'm a creature of the left, at least to some extent, myself. So I'm sympathetic to that idea as far as it goes. I do think, though, that you have to be very, very careful. It, it's very easy once you think that a lot is at stake that you get into a, a kind of zone in your mind where you think there cannot be any nuance or any dissent. You just have to shut down any ideas that don't, you know, that don't fully match the agenda, that don't fully match the, you know, the program. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great danger. We, we, we've seen so many examples of it over the centuries. Yeah, Christianity was like this when it took over the pagan world in late antiquity. You know, suddenly Christianity had been a persecuted religion, suddenly it gains control, becomes the official religion in the 4th century AD, and suddenly you see Christianity turning around and persecuting the pagans. And let's do it to the Jews especially, right? Let's oh, the <laughs> Jews, of course, um, the Manichaeans, yeah, anybody that... <laughs> We have got to have our exact program operating, and 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 we will be very harsh in what we do. Of course, yeah, yeah. we'll we'll start expelling the Jews. We'll yeah, you know, we'll start burning the Manichaeans at the stake. Yeah, we'll 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 do all these things. You know, it's it, it's a huge danger. Whatever Christianity may have been an improvement in some ways on on paganism, right? It, yeah, it, you know, it it wanted to shut down the you know the 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 gladiatorial games, you know, and it probably was a bit less harsh to women than uh, in some ways at least. Yeah, that means, you know, that Christianity context. may have been better in some ways, but it suddenly becomes this persecutorial thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see that again and again through history. I'm going back to antiquity, but you can see it in the French Revolution. You can see it all sorts of in all sorts of historical periods. And I think to some extent we see it now. People will say very mild, sens sensible things that are not part of the program, and, and suddenly they have to be shut down, they have to be branded as something that they're not. They're, you know, we're told that some perfectly liberal person somewhere on the left is alt-right alt or a misogynist or yeah. they're, they're that. Their attempts to get them fired, all those things. So, yeah, there's some truth in the critique that you presented for us but there are also a lot of dangers when you start to think that way if you're if you see the stakes as very high and you think of it as very necessary that everyone be exactly on board you'll you'll find yourself suppressing dissent and suppressing you know what may be good ideas and suppressing what may be good and potentially helpful people yeah yeah you know i wonder you know one of the one of the ways in which they justify this sort of ferocity of the of of the of the of of the of the, of the, the let's call it revolt um, is by what I've been calling the abusing the harm principle. That is, you know, um, you know, wow. e even within a liberal framework, Mill is ex you know explicitly says this. Um, um, one one is justified both governmentally and by way of social sanction in infringing upon someone's liberty either to speak or to act um, if they are harming others, right? Mm. Now, um, it seems pretty clear to me that what Mill meant by harm was something relatively narrow and, and, and precise and something that was demonstrable, right? Um, but here's what I want to sort of get at with you and ask you about. Um, half of me thinks that they're abusing the harm principle, and I think some of them are, and I think in some cases it's cynical. But... 
and maybe you haven't noticed this as much because you're not teaching students as much as I am, but I have definitely noticed in the last 10 to 15 years, and I think that that the data will show this out, that the students are much more psychologically fr- brittle and fragile and 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 easily easily disturbed um the rates of mental illness seem to be very high the mm. the, the 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 rates of anxiety and depression seem to be very high um so are they really abusing the harm principle or maybe are we in a chicken egg situation where one is beginning the other, you know, yeah, they're a bit more fragile. And so we're, we're going to great lengths to not hurt their feelings and to give them safe spaces. But then that just makes them even more fragile. I mean, do you think that there's anything about the current state of young people that might justify a loosening of the harm principle um, for those who aren't, who aren't doing it cynically, obviously? Look, it's very hard to know. I haven't been teaching really for, what, 10 years now. Now, the students I was teaching 10 years ago didn't seem particularly like that. Yeah. But it has only been in the last 10 years that I've really noticed this, you know, this strong movement on the left and particularly among students. I don't know what caused it. I know a lot has been written about what may have caused it. I think some of it is an illusion. I mean, you know, some of what I see is not, students who are themselves traumatised by the slightest dissent, but worried that someone else will be. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, you know, this feeling that if you say the wrong thing, you're going to be driving people from this group to suicide or that group to suicide. That, you know, there's, a, there's a kind of ideology that's grown up around mental illness and mental fragility. How much that reflects the reality, I don't know. There certainly is more vocalisation these days of depression and anxiety, how much more there really is, I just don't know. Yeah, whether it's even possible to find out. I mean, yeah, you know, this is one of those things that's really hard to that's really um, that's really hard to study. Um, partly because as reporting goes up, it's very hard to disambiguate whether you really have more of the phenomenon and you just have more people sort of talking about it. And I think the point you just made is sort of well taken, also especially when you're talking about places like Yale, it's really hard to believe that anybody who's a student at Yale is particularly oppressed, right? I mean, you're not talking about the ultra, ultra elite of the country, no matter what racial or or, or sexual category you Mm. belong to. Mm. If you're at Yale, you're in about the most rarefied environment you can be in. So there is, does seem to me to be quite a bit of, you know, sort of being upset on behalf of hypothetical other people, right? Um, 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 But I'm trying, I want to try and be judged because I have noticed in the classroom that the students seem to be more fragile. But of course, I'm not at a Yale. I'm at a very, very lower middle grade sort of mm. public university that mostly draws from the region and the region is not a wealthy region. I live in the lower Midwest. So I am definitely seeing, seeing more um, fragile people. Um, um, now, whether that justifies in any event um, uh, loosening the harm principle and mucking around with sort of the principles of liberty is, is a different question. And that maybe will move us nicely to the next part. I know I'm going out of order in the book. You kind of talk about liberalism first and then you you sort of move to what sort of some of the attacks on it have been, and we're going in the opposite order. But maybe now you could just say something about what you take to be so valuable and important about the liberal tradition and why even in such very different times that we have now than when liberalism was initially created, why it's still so important to protect and to preserve. Well, look, I think there are a number of answers to that, as there are in Mill. You know, the, the traditional kind of answers about freedom of, of speech and the general freedom that we have to live our lives. I mean, partly it's important because of the freedom of our speech. You know, we just want some reassurance that we can say what we think about important issues. That, you know, we can think and investigate, inquire, discuss. I mean, that's very important to us as individuals. I mean, people use fancy terms like self-actualization, but we don't even need those sorts of terms. It's, I think, pretty obvious why it's important to have the government off our back and society off our back in relation to being able to inquire, make up our own minds and express our own minds. Now, beyond that, There are social benefits, of course. If you're not suppressing ideas, then the ideas are there available in society. Even if the ideas 
are overall not good ideas. There may be a grain of truth in them that it's worth someone else picking up. And this is the way progress is made. I mean, I'm, I'm enough, I suppose, of a 19th century liberal to think that, you know, progress is actually a good thing. That, you know, that it's good to have ideas that society can work on and go forward with and not suppress. I mean, I also see historically what happens when you start uh, thinking that it's okay to suppress ideas. You, know, you get this mindset where you actually start you know, persecuting and, and creating atrocities. You know, people start being destroyed over nothing. So, yeah, there's a whole range of, of issues here. There's the fact that we need to be able to criticise the government if we're not to, to avoid tyranny something that Mill mentions briefly, passes over, but thinks it's just obvious, and that's a large part of the liberal tradition, of course. And just if we're going to have a democracy at all, and with all the good things behind democracy, again, we need to be able to talk about politics. So there's three or four different issues there. I don't think there's one single theory that drives them all. For Mill, it was largely the idea about being able to discuss ideas and make progress and you know, live um, our lives in our own way, have experiments in living, and again, be able to make progress through that. That that idea of progress is a very strong 19th century idea, of course, but all those ideas uh, are there for Mill, and they all interrelate, and I think they're all still ideas that are worthwhile. You know, something you just said I want to ask you directly to speak to, especially having been both an attorney and um, mm. a public servant, um, is it possible to have a non-liberal democracy? Uh, I, mean, I mean, look, obviously it's possible, right, in, in that sense. But can one is it, is it possible to have a remotely desirable non-liberal democracy? Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, does democracy depend essentially upon free and open public discourse? Or do you think that there, you know, because, because sometimes I wonder about whether the, the, the so-called progressives really understand what it is they're asking for. I mean, mm. I'm not inclined to think you can really have a democracy without it being liberal to a great extent, but maybe you could speak directly to that question. Well, I think that to a great extent is important. You could probably have a democracy where there's a lot of consensus about morality, for example, and there's a lot of enforcement of morality. So, yes, you probably could have a democracy that in some senses is um, traditional rather than liberal, but you do need a lot of freedom to debate politics. And if you're going to shape political ideas, you need a lot of freedom, a circle out beyond that, to be able to debate moral ideas and to, you know, and to, um, to model and represent alternative approaches to morality. So I, so I would say to make democracy really work, you need a lot of political freedom and beyond that you need a lot of freedom to live your life um here's a phrase you often hear um in res in response to critiques like this um <clears throat> and that is and this will get again to the back to the sort of core question of you know to, in in what way is this threatening um you'll often hear people say well what these what these activists and other people who are engaged in these kinds of um, uh, let's let's just call them sort of uh, uh, silencing campaigns, yeah. they're not really they're not really infringing on your speech or your ability to 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 uh, speak. Um, what they're but the, what they are doing is not allowing you to avoid the consequences of your speech. Right? <laughs> um, um, uh, what's wrong with that? I mean, listen, this is so, you I hear that so often. Like, but what's I mean, wrong it's... with this answer? But, I mean, if we're saying you can speak, but who will be the consequence? And the consequence is we will punish you. I mean, that's pretty much saying you can't speak, right? Yeah, we're going, we're going to enforce. You can speak, but you won't have a job, right? <laughs> <laughs> you won't have a job. You won't have your family. You won't have your sanity because we're going to give you such a hard time. Yeah, we won't do it necessarily through the government, but we'll do it in all these other ways. We'll make a mockery of you on Twitter. You'll be a hashtag. We'll get you fired. Yeah, we'll destroy your career. We will drive a wedge between you and your loved ones by saying all these terrible things about you and driving them into a, you know, a, a state of despair. I mean, I've seen some of this in my own life and I've certainly seen all these public examples. I mean, that, that saying, you know, these are 
just the natural consequences of your speech. Well, they're not the natural consequences at all. They're consequences that people have chosen to inflict and they've yeah. chosen in concert yeah. to inflict. It's, it's not the same as just saying, well, this person seems to have a worldview that I find abrasive. I won't invite that person over for dinner. You know, that, if, that might be a natural consequence. But these kind of public campaigns destroy people's lives and not. They're a deliberately chosen consequence. Let me ask you something else, and this this also, I guess, would be a question to Mill. And and you do really spend a good amount of time in the in the book talking about Mill and defending yeah. the various aspects of it. Um, you correctly, of course, identify that Mill is both concerned with um, governmental infringements upon liberty as well as um, social san- social sanction, um, mm. uh, 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 social. Uh, uh, circum, uh, 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 constraints. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this, because this is something that occurred to me. Um, aren't isn't one in a sense sort of at, at the expense of the other? In other words, look, I mean, if we don't want to have laws against it, then what we need to do is be able to publicly shame about it, right? I mean, in other words, why isn't the social sanction? the better the, the, what you do in order to not have to have all of this government regulation. Right. right. Um, I, I guess that's what I want to ask, sort of ask you. So if we don't trust the government to shame the right, or well, to punish the right things, we'll trust ourselves to punish the right things. Is that kind of the argument? Well, but, but also the, that it's less heavy handed, right? I mean, like the right. state, you know, I can sh- publicly shame you, and yes, I'll hurt you in various ways, but I can't hurt you the way that the government can, right? I, mean, okay. I can't imprison I mean, you. I can't shoot you down in the street. I can't. Right. Um, and, and I know a lot of the conservatives have often said that, look, you know, we should we should have a lot more social sanction and a lot less governmental. What, yeah. what do you find? What do you find mistaken about that juxtaposition? Right, and and of course, I'm not. A conservative, you know that that kind of view worries me when it comes from conservatives as well. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. The, the fact is, however you do it, whether it's through shaming campaigns, whether it's through you know campaigns on Twitter to get people fired, whether it's through literally mobbing people, as happened to Christakis at Yale, you are still you know punishing them for their ideas and their speech. You are still setting an example that shows, well, if this is what you say, this is what will happen to you. Now, the effect might not be the same as the government locking you away in prison or shooting you in the street or burning you at the stake, but it can still be very powerful. I mean, you still get people placed in, in terrible situations where they lose their livelihoods. You know, we, we hear examples of people who, who will tell you, you know, they were called out of the table contemplating suicide. You know, the, we are conforming animals, and when it seems that our society has turned against us, the, the effects really are devastating, even though they may not be burning at the stake. Yeah. So it so it it still has something of that same power to yeah you know, to suppress ideas, to suppress people, to destroy people, to destroy people's livelihoods, to destroy what makes life worth living for them. Uh, all for the sake of demanding that a certain kind of of line be followed. Yeah. 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 I mean, we shouldn't have to have either Franco or mobs, right? We should, we should be able to have neither one, right? I guess (laughs) sort of what, it's sort of what you're suggesting, um, which seems to me to be perfectly fair. Um, I am, I'm just trying to sort of think of all of the sort of ways in which people have tried to reply to this because I make these arguments a lot of times myself. I mean, like I said, I'm super sympathetic to the book and everybody who knows me knows that I have been pushing sort of this traditional relatively classical liberalism for quite a while. Um, but there are, there are responses and I think it is important to engage with them. Um, um, just so that at least people know that you're, you're acting in good faith, that we're acting in fake, good faith. Yeah. Um, look, if, yeah. see, if, if you're some kind of political libertarian, yeah, you know, the, the kind of political libertarian that is pretty common in the US, right? <laughs> You'll have what I see as a sort of fetish about the government. You'll think that the government is really the main or the only, um, like yeah, threat to liberty. Yeah, but 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 that wasn't Mill's view. No, and I, and I don't think it's the right view. You know, we 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 are under pressure all the time to to conform, and sometimes that's a good thing. 
Yeah. But in too many cases where, you know, where it's not a good thing, where someone has something worthwhile saying or someone has a way of life that perhaps doesn't conform to, to the norm and, you know, might be useful to have as a way of life that's available in the society. Yeah. Society through all these other ways can come down in, in, in ways that are destructive. Yeah. That, that's, that's the real liberal tradition to, to be aware of, of those points. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to that kind of political libertarian tradition. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're living in a dictatorship, then political liberty is your main concern, right? Yeah. But, but Mill's not writing for people living in dictatorships. He's writing for people living in, in, in democracies or then proto democracies. And, um, there the main concern is social, social, social tyranny, right? Um, um, because, you know, the government, you know, the, the, the flip side to what I, that conservative argument I gave, well, you know, wouldn't we rather have more social sanction and less state? And the answer is, well, yes and no. It depends, you know, what state and where. I mean, our state, is incredibly constrained by all sorts of rules and laws and yeah. checks and balances. Yeah. You know, the cops can't just do whatever they want, you know, and if they do, you drag them into court and all that. And there isn't that kind of constraint on social sanctioning, yeah. right? And so in yeah. a sense, the yeah. gov- I am a little bit more afraid of our mobs than of the government because I know the government is kind of tied up. <laughs> um, um, and so in free societies, I do think it's a, in relatively free societies, I think, I think it is fair to can be more concerned with social sanction than governmental tyranny. Sure. And look, even from a, a, a view of being prudent yourself, if you're some sort of left wing activist, <laughs> yeah, you should want to hear your know, other interpretations and other ideas. Yeah, you shouldn't want some sort of inflexible dogma. Right. So it's, it's not even healthy. For, for left-wing activism to, you know, to have a, a set program that, that can't be departed from. And, you, and of course, you see, you know, left-wing groups tear each other to pieces so over their internal debates as to what should be the program. This is notoriously something that, that happened with feminism, you know, back in the 1960s and 1970s. It continues to some extent to happen to feminism yeah. because the stakes are so high you know, it's thought we must do it exactly this way because the stakes are so high and we must have our society just the way we want it. But then someone else thinks the stakes are high. And next thing, even within a left-wing um, yeah, activist program, you, you've got this mutual trashing and mutual destruction going on. You know, that stakes are high line. I mean, it's it's – God, it's so tricky because – Look, sometimes the stakes really are high. Right? Sure. But, 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 but what you're describing here, I think, is really dangerous, and that is a kind of stakes inflation, right? Yeah. Um, where, you know, this notion that everything is always an emergency, right? I mean, I, for some reason I'm getting – I don't know when this started, and maybe this isn't in Australia, this, but in the United States, I don't know exactly when this started. Maybe it was 9-11. But now every single newscast you watch has a red line running underneath the bottom with breaking this and breaking that. And none of it is anything that anybody would have thought was breaking in a time when you didn't think everything was a big, was, an, right. was a, a, right. a four alarm fire. Mm. And I guess, you know, can that genie be put back in? Can stakes inflation be, be reined back or is it kind of a runaway kind of horse that now we just have to contend with and try to mitigate? Yeah. Well, I'm very worried about this. I sometimes feel I'm just, yeah, pissing into the wind, really. No, I'm worried about when, it too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I write a book like The Tyranny of Opinion. I say, yeah, certain things are happening and, you know, we've got to be aware of it. We've got to try to wind it back. And then, you know, the book comes out, as you say, in late 2018, and I see more and more of these things happening. You know, I haven't made a huge impact. I would like to raise consciousness as far as I can, but I'm worried about where it's going. You know, I, I, I ask people to try to make efforts to resist it. I ask people to, you know, to be honest about what they really think, not conform to what is said around them that they must think, you know, to be as far as is safe for them, uh, you know, open and honest and willing to dissent and offer their own ideas. But it is very difficult putting that genie back in the bottle, as you say. And I, I don't know how it's going to go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think that we could see a bad future for you know, liberal ideas in that wider sense that I was talking about earlier. What um, what's your impression 
I don't know how much you you watch other scenes, but what's your sense of, and if this is in the book and I forgot about it, please accept my apologies. What is your perception of the relative um, severity of this problem across the developed world? So Australia versus, let's say, the UK versus the US versus continental Europe. What's your impression of how this has been playing out Look, it's hard to have that yeah, in a detailed way at your fingertips. It seems to be worse in the US. A lot of the real craziness seems to be coming from the US. However, you certainly see a great deal of it in the UK. And here in Australia, we may be a little bit later to the party. I think that may be part of why I was blindsided by it a little bit, you know, the last... 10, 15 years or whatever, but nonetheless, we're seeing a lot of it here. I certainly see a lot of people who I once thought were sensible, you know, coming out with, you know, very extreme and illiberal views, illiberal (laughs) views, you know, here in Australia. As for places like France and Italy and Germany, it's hard to tell. They do have different traditions. My, My feeling is that yeah, you know, the exact kinds of things we are talking about have still been resisted to some extent in those countries. But but they do have different traditions there on the left, and there's probably always been some of this. I mean, even in the nineteen sixties, you can see some of this during that yeah, you know, very revolutionary period in you know, in the late sixties in France. But but I still think the real epicenter of this particular kind of Illiberalism is the U.S. and the U.K. The US. and the U.K. to a second. Uh, the, I get the sense that it's it's just as bad in the U.K., but unlike in the U.S., there's a more forceful, empowered um, uh, striking back against it. Right? I'm seeing, I'm seeing. You know, in other words, in the U. and the, the U.S. Mm-hmm. seems to be the people. It seems to be acquiescing a lot more, and the in the U.K. seems to be at least fighting. People seem to be fighting against it more. Uh, is it? So you're telling me in in, in Australia. This sort of no platforming and stuff is happening at University of Melbourne and oh, Sydney, yeah, yeah. And, and and I mean, there's certainly been attempts, some successful, some not so successful, but there've certainly been attempts to no platform certain kinds of speakers. So uh, there's an anti-feminist speaker, I suppose you could call her. Though she'd still see herself as a kind of feminist, a woman called Bettina Arndt. Who I suppose is our equivalent of someone like Christina Hoff Summers. Summers, okay, um, someone like that. I mean, she certainly faces attempts to no-platform her wherever she goes. And the kind of argument that will be used to no-platform is a kind of argument that you were talking about earlier, that her speech is somehow somehow harmful, you know, it's psychologically harmful to the students to hear that some aspects of feminism might not be true after all, or maybe men have a bad deal in some ways, or or whatever it is that she wants to say. You know, that, that these sorts of ideas are so so harmful and so hurtful to people that they should not be heard on university campuses. You, you certainly hear that here in Australia now. Not to the extent that I think you do in places like the elite universities in the US, but, but you do get that here now. And, how and, are and you'll get yeah, go crazy ahead. arguments for it. Yeah, how are the institutions... That. So aside from a few places like the University of Chicago, which have taken very strong stands, mm. the US university as institutions have been really terrible in protecting what I would have thought would have been sort of almost sacred values on their Mm. campus. Um, How have the Australian academic and other relevant institutions been responding to these illiberal sort of pressures? Mm. Look, my general feeling about that is they don't, they don't really understand the problem yet. They're starting to see that there's a problem yeah, there's starting to be discussions. Uh, I know one friend of mine uh, at one of the major universities uh, was involved uh, with a, a kind of forum that was put together to address this. But but certainly the impression I got from her was that, you know, the people involved in that forum didn't really understand the problem in the way that, that we're discussing it and that we're at an early stage in understanding it. You know, we're, we're at a stage where we're maybe a bit behind the US in the problem becoming a problem and people are starting to latch on to these highly illiberal ideas. Uh, but we're a fair way from 
the people who should be reacting to it, understanding it and reacting to it. But then again, as you say, in the US, there aren't that many institutions that are reacting to it well either. No, they've reacted terribly. Um, and part of the issue is, and I, this is why I was sort of wondering whether your institutions might perhaps be a bit more hardy than ours. Um, unlike the US, then the UK and Australia, mm. um, university, higher education is not this enormous business, right? I mean, in other words, part of the reason why in America the, the institutions have capitulated so easily is because they're engaged now in much more what I would call customer service than in um, education, right? I mean, we have a very All much right. capitalistic free market model, even our public universities, are are really sort of whoring for whoring for money to put it that way, but your institutions are all public, are they not? I mean, people aren't paying seventy thousand dollars a year to go to the University of Melbourne. So, yeah, it might not be quite as utopian as you think. Well, I don't know I mean, if I would uh, be utopian. I'm just wondering whether <laughs> you you might have a better resistance to this sort of thing, yeah, because you're not uh, subjected to the profit motive as much. Yeah, the, the thing is, they are very onto to the profit motive. Yeah, there, there's a lot of government funding now government institutions, but a lot of money also comes from outside uh, the government. A lot of the money comes from outside Australia. Australian institutions, this is a slightly different problem. But no, but explain that. Idea. I don't think people know Australian that. institutions are very heavily dependent these days on students from overseas. A lot of oh. Asian students, a lot of Chinese students and students from other countries in, um, because they pay in Asia, more come to Australia yeah. on a fee-paying basis. That's a large source of income for, for um, the Australian higher education system. So there's also a problem that the uh, quite separate from any of this stuff that the Australian universities want to be very careful not to say things that offend China. <laughs> That's the same problem as you see in the entertainment industry these days. You know, you make a Marvel superhero movie and your second biggest audience is going to be Chinese, so you're very careful uh, not to say things that offend the Chinese government. So, so a separate problem, but a problem of commercialisation, which is you know, very much um, up and running here in Australia. Now, why? Forgive me if this is an idiot question, but is it simply because of geogra geography? Or what, why in, is Australia more dependent on China than... We are, then, then you know, you know what I mean. In other words, why particularly are they so concerned about upsetting well, China? Well, it's a way of well, like, I, look, I don't know that I can readily compare the US in that that way, but but certainly it's a way for Australian institutions to make a lot of money. And because we do have good universities, you know, our top universities are maybe only one layer below the you know the Ivy Leagues in the US and you know, the Oxbridge type institutions in the UK. You know, they're a layer down from that, but only a layer down. Uh, it's a place where if you're in Asia, you can go and you can get a you know, Western-style English language education. Without having to go on the other side of the planet. Without, yeah. 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 No, I, Australian institutions are very um, highly regarded. I, certainly in philosophy they are. I mean, good grief. Given the population, I mean, you've produced an astonishing number of top-notch yeah. philosophers, and um, some of my um, most respected colleagues are people that originally came from Australia. Um, um, especially University of Melbourne seems to be yeah. uh, have been a powerhouse in philosophy. Um, um, well, Monash University traditionally yeah. was the Australian National University. Yeah. You know, is really only a step down from those Ivy Leagues and so on. It was a very highly rated university with a very strong philosophy department and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see, you think that there, even though you know, education is public and perhaps there isn't quite as much pandering to the students as sort of in the customer model of the U.S., but you still think that there's sufficient financial pressure that it can be exploited, it gets exploited by people who are trying to suppress speech in order to advance various agendas and... Well, it's certainly very commercialised, and certainly you know, a lot of those pressures are there. You know, if you're a senior administrator in an Australian university, you are going to want to keep your students happy, and you'll want to keep a whole lot of other stakeholders happy, from yeah, you know, from the Chinese government down, but also local business, you know, big business, big national business, all, all kinds of stakeholders yeah. that you have to try to keep yeah. happy. Yeah, is there a similar? Is there similar cloud played on the on the part? of wealthy alumni 
with respect to Australian universities that you have with you in the United States? No, probably not. That, 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 I don't know what percentage of income would come from those sorts of people, but, but no. Because in the I, U.S., I it's considerable. I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes just shocked by the things my university does, which demonstrably are just to please, like, four people, right? Like, yeah. like four yeah. alumni, you know what I mean? It's just like, what on earth? <laughs> and then you realize the amounts that these people are donating. No, I, I get letters from universities all the time because I've got degrees from, what, three universities, I guess. And, I, you know, and I'm always being asked to, to give money. So there certainly are attempts to to soak the alumni <laughs> if universities can. But this kind of thing you're talking about where some huge donors have enormous influence, I, I don't really see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it, it's it's – I, I was battling with myself whether to ask a coronavirus question because everybody yeah. is just so fucking sick of it. But there, I think there was enough of this in the air that I do want to ask you about it. Mm. I think that there was, there, for a little while, there was the sort of that this pandemic and the emergency was sort of like such a heavy dose of cold, brutal reality that mm. maybe a lot of this the idea being that maybe a lot of this illiberalism was essentially a kind of a luxury, right? It was a kind of a behavior yeah. that people could engage in when people weren't dropping dead in the street and people weren't locked in their houses and people, the food supply chain wasn't going to be broken. Um, and I think there was a short period where people were saying, Oh, you can, you can kiss all this woke politically correct stuff. Goodbye. Now, of course that, that didn't happen. Um, I guess what I would ask though is why do you think it hasn't happened? I mean, in a certain sense, they are luxuries, right? These kinds of, these kinds of complaints, right? I mean, these sure. kinds of, they are in a sense luxuries. Um, they're almost entirely features of the developed world. You know, you, you don't hear people having these arguments, you know, in, in, in places where people are, you know, barely managing to live. Why do you think that even this big of a blow hasn't shaken out people? sort of, all right, what was I talking about? What, what, why do you think it's... Why do you Look, think I it's, think it becomes a new forum for highly politicised debate. <laughs> you know, we're now debating exactly what parts of industry and education and whatever else should be shut down or should not be shut down. I mean, I've noticed here in Australia, the, you know, the view that you have to take if you're a long way out on the left is that absolutely everything has to be shut down. And people will get very, you know, emotional and fierce about that. You know, the, the, the idea that anything at all should be kept open is, you know, it's anathema. Yeah. So it's a, so you get one more thing that you, you can argue about. That you can feed into. I, I mean, I, must, I mean, Australia is actually by world standards doing, you know, very well with, the, you know, the, the whole coronavirus thing. That's partly, I think, because we got onto it pretty quickly. It's partly because, Australia's not such a just you know, mess politically as the US is with 50 states all at each other's throats. The state premiers, I suppose, the equivalent of your state governors and our prime minister, who's more or less equivalent to your president, uh, meet frequently in what they now call the national cabinet to try to work out national policy on what steps should be taken next. And largely they do reach consensus. Uh, the decisions are implemented slightly differently state by state, but there's only six states and two territories. And largely we've had a concerted, agreed response, which has been fairly successful so far. But that response has been basically about cutting out socialising, social activities. So there's an attempt to keep uh, industry going, to keep, um, retail going, you know, the shops are basically open unless they choose to shut. But what have been shut are clubs, bars, pubs, you know, um, uh, beaches, <laughs> anywhere where people get together and socialise in large numbers. Anywhere where you have a good time. Down rigorously. Down. Hmm? <laughs> anywhere where you have a good time has been shut well, down. That's right. We're supposed <laughs> to stop having a good time. We can go shopping. We can buy our stuff in the supermarket, whatever. We can go to restaurants, but only for takeaway, takeout. Yeah. Uh, yeah they're, they're shut in so far as they can't have uh, customers sitting down and socialising. So the whole strategy has been to cut socialising, but to try to keep... Uh, 
you know, industry retail um, education going in at least a basic sort of way. Now, the left-wing position, uh, yeah, among the sort of people we're talking about, that very yeah. um, strong left-wing position is we just, we have to shut the schools. Now, the schools are going at the moment in a sort of haphazard way, you know, largely shut, doing a lot of um, distance education and so on, but they have not been totally shut. <laughs> But the idea that they should be totally shut has become a kind of shibboleth yeah. among the the woke, if you want to put it like yeah. that. So, yeah. so anyway, this is a long-winded way of saying the, the point that I was making before, that all this has done really is to create a new battlefield for you know, highly um, polarised you know, politics. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as horrible as this sounds... I mean, I do think that there is a level of calamity that would be sufficient to to shake people out of what really is a kind of a luxury. Um, um, but I fear it's going to have to be a lot worse than this. I mean, this, you know, I, you know, it would have to be a more like a bubonic plague level sort yeah, of no. thing to think to shake anybody out of it. Um, this just isn't enough. All, it, but it's just enough to give everybody enough self righteous energy to sort of <laughs> to sort of find new and innovative ways to um, to moralize to each other. Well, um, so we're all stuck at home now, so or, or largely so. We're all stuck at home. Uh, hanging out more than ever on social media, yeah. Yeah. which is a great place to hang out for political polarization if political polarization is what yeah. you want. Well, after you've murdered everyone in your house, the only people left to murder are the people out on social media, right? So you may as well go, you may as well go and murder them next. Look, um, I must admit, we've been semi-locked down in the way I described for about eight weeks now, I suppose. And... For a lot of those weeks, I was fine with it. You know, it didn't change my routine all that much, really. I've got you know, a modest but quite nice house here. I've got a backyard. I've got a park nearby. Everything's good. But but even I'm getting to stage now where I'm a bit stir crazy. So, you know, everybody's saying to feel a little like irritable, that. right? A little. <laughs> and people who are less privileged than I am in that sense, who are stuck in little apartments with people maybe they don't like. Yeah, I can't imagine. I, I think people underestimate what that must be like in small flats without a lot of land. I mean, I live in a suburban area. I've got an acre of land. I mean, right, I've got a 4,000 yeah. square foot house with only three people living in it because real estate in Southern Missouri is dirt cheap. Um, right. um, you know, this house in, in New York, in Long Island would cost, you know, three, $4 million. Mm. Um, I think people underestimate just how tough that is. Um, um, but um, let me ask you just as we sort of uh, get to the end, towards the end, um, I, I know talking about remedies about something like this is very sort of, I don't know, glib, but but you do actually have, I mean, I, I actually in my review, I did bullet some of the ones that I thought were the most significant, but you do have a whole set of sort of recommendations, mm. right? Mm. Um, and so maybe you could just summarize what you think are the, some of the, the, the more interesting or maybe, or maybe more likely to succeed um, like what, remedies. Yeah. What are some of the things you say in the book about um, what you think we need to do to sort of get back, get yeah. back with our tradition, the liberal tradition? Yeah. I mean, I, I have got points like not, not participating in trial by media or trial by social media, you know, actually, pushing back against trial by media of people, you know, whether it's trial for a criminal case or whether it's trial for the kind of dissent we're talking about. Um, I just, yeah, just look in the mirror and think of yourself as the sort of person who cares about being you know, honest and revealing their true self. Yeah, those are the kind of points. I mean, there's a whole lot of them. Yeah, don't assume that where you see a lot of smoke, there's fire. Yeah, don't, don't be the, that person who makes that assumption. Uh, I myself have sometimes assumed that there must be some sort of fire where there's smoke, well, yeah. like with some of these you know, famous cases we've been talking about. But sometimes it turns out that there's really no fire at all. It's just that somebody said something which has then been distorted into something that they didn't say, and, and next thing, yeah, there's a whole lot of smoke surrounding them. So, so those sort of points, don't make those sort of assumptions. Do push back. Don't participate in trial by media. Don't participate in trial by social media. You know, look carefully when someone is being hashtagged and so on. You know, look in the mirror and see yourself as that kind of person that really cares about 
you know, expressing what they are honestly rather than um, conforming. There's a whole lot of others which I can't even necessarily remember off the top of my head. But but those are the kinds of points that I make. The trouble with all of them, I must say, uh, after the book's now been out for 18 months or so, is it's hard to get people voluntarily to make those decisions, those, those sort of commitments. Some have. I mean, some people have spoken to me that, you know, they've read the book and it's made a difference to how they think and how they're acting and they are now positively trying to do some of those things. Um, but while I may get some people to voluntarily rethink that way and make those sort of commitments, there's a hell of a lot of other people out there who either won't read the book or won't be convinced to do those things. So I'm, 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 I'm not feeling super optimistic about what can be done. There's a long way to go with this. It's going to be very difficult to push it back if it can be done at all. Let me ask you one more thing along those lines, and then I will let you go. You've been very generous with your time. Um, Look, you're in a sense calling for people to behave better. When you say look at yourself in the mirror, you're saying ask yourself what kind of person you are and what kind of person yeah. you want to be. All of that depends upon individual will and individual um, mm. um, action. And 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 as you say, you know, they're not doing it now. Why should they do it just because I, I, I say so? Let me ask you this, because you are a lawyer and you have been involved in public policy. Suppose enough people could get together to where they could actually create a political movement, right, to sort of mm. reaffirm or reassert liberalism. Do you see anything legislatively in terms of laws, anything that could be done or that you think would be a good idea to be done in the developed nations, um, in a governmental or a state or a, a regulatory capacity to sort of make it harder to do this kind of thing? Or is there anything legally or politically you think that can be done about this if we could get together a political movement to push for it? Look, there are some things that can be done. Like libel laws. Or, or you, you, yeah. You don't want to turn into the very thing you're fighting. That's always the risk with these things. You create a new political movement, and next thing it's you right. who's yeah. uh, Robespierre or whatever, who's you know, creating the reign of terror. But, but there are sensible things that can be done. Look, here in Australia, one advantage that we do have is that we actually have strong labour laws, much stronger than those mm. that exist in the US. It is much more difficult for employers to fire people. No. Uh, we, we have a federal law called the Fair Work Act, which, among other things, you know, has a whole range of forbidden reasons. You know, I know there's some in your legislation, but there's a whole range here. Uh, you know, you can't fire people for your know, race, sex, um, you know, sexual orientation, you know, religion, all, all kinds of things. P- uh, political opinion. Can't fire people for political opinion. Oh, is so that in law? Are, that's in law? That's law in, in Australia. Yeah, you yeah, cannot yeah, yeah. fire. So if somebody comes and tries to get you fired because you don't think trans women are women, they can't fire you for that. Well, I would hope it would be interpreted that way, yes. Now, probably the people who wrote that law just thought you can't be fired for voting for the Labor Party or you can't be fired for voting for the, the Liberal Party, right? But there, there becomes a whole lot of interesting political debates or, or, sorry, a whole lot of legal debates about how these laws should be interpreted. And, uh, and as you know, most cases in, in law generally settle rather than going to trial. So there's not a lot of case law on how the legislation is to be interpreted. But nonetheless, that legislation is there. Now, we had a very high-profile case here with a a very high-profile sportsman, a guy called Israel Folau, who was a champion uh, rugby union player. Rugby union is a fairly big sport here, one of the few countries where it is a fairly big sport. He was fired because he put up a Facebook, well, it wasn't Facebook, but a social media post, one of the social media, where he paraphrased a verse from the New Testament where he said, all sorts of people are going to hell if they don't repent. And among those people were, of course, um, you know, gay men. Right? I remember this case. This even, this yeah, yeah. even got over here. Yeah, I remember right. that. Yeah. Now, he did take action under the Fair Work Act. And His was case protected? was settled. We don't know what the settlement was, but it's believed that a very large payout, yeah, perhaps like a seven-figure payout, 
was given to him in the end. So he was able to use that that law successfully, at least to get very substantial compensation. Now, of course, I thought that was quite appropriate. He was saying the very kinds of things that are utterly anathema to me, but I think he should be allowed to say them. Without being deprived of his livelihood, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was not that popular among <laughs> yeah, the sort of people that I hang out with uh, in saying these things. That said... You, you know, it's a funny thing. People, when you talk to them over a cup of coffee or over a beer, will be much more liberal than people will seem to be on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the social media view, though, on the left was very much, yes, people like this should have their livelihoods destroyed. Yeah, they're very strong campaigns for our first to be fired and then not to be, you know, reinstated or compensated or whatever, you know, quite virulent things are said about, you know, attempts to raise money for his legal case, etc. Nonetheless, the moral of the story is just that we do have strong labour laws here, uh, much stronger than in the US, and I think that's a good thing. You know, l- labour laws insofar as they make it difficult for employers to sack you for reasons that don't relate to... You know, to work-related misconduct or to genuinely poor performance at your actual job, you know, to, to me, those sorts of employment protections are a good thing. So is, is it that, would help just to have those for a start. Is that, in Australia, the result of very strong labour unions or is that a result of yes. political consensus? Uh, a bit of both. But, yes, we have had a very strong labour movement here historically. And you still it's not do. not so strong these days. It's a lot weakened these days. Because in America, it's almost completely destroyed, the labour movement. Right, yeah. And that obviously tracked the abandonment of industry. I mean, we've, in a sense, outsourced all of our manufacturing and industry to other countries. And those were the biggest, strongest unions, right? Um, um, mm. um, I'm assuming Australia, being a fully advanced developed nation, is also exported. I'm assuming you don't right. produce. Into, so how have the unions maintained their strength in Australia? Well, the trade union movement has been greatly weakened here mm. in Australia. Nonetheless, the general ethos here in Australia, you know, the, 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 the vibe of the country, you know, still has those kind of ideas. And elections are fought over you know, labour relations policy and over, you know, general, a, a more class-based economic po- policy set of policies, I think, than is the case in the US. You know, they fought over those traditional issues that the labour movement took up, even though the trade union movement itself is now weaker. But it still has a voice in government. You know, even during the current COVID crisis, you know, the, you know, the quite right-wing government that we have here at the federal level was nonetheless consulting the trade union movement. Now, I don't know how much that would happen in the US, but I imagine not very much. Yeah, no, it wouldn't it wouldn't at all. Um so one 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 not relying on people to disbehave well way of trying to resist this might be to sort of push for stronger labor protections just in general, because then people's jobs are just protected no matter what bad reason one someone wants to try to fire you. Is there anything else like that? that you think can be accomplished politically or through legislation? Well, that's one thing you can do. At the level of universities and colleges, you can do things. You, know, you, you can have things like the Chicago Statement. You, know, you can have high-level university and college administrators taking this problem seriously. A, a step up from this is if state governments start taking seriously the problem on university campuses and enacting legislation requiring universities to take it seriously. Now, I mean, that could have its own dangers because the universities want to retain their independence and so on. So you have to be very careful about just what sort of legislation you might support there. But I would not rule out that sort of legislation. I know, again, there's very strong resistance to it when it's mooted, but if it's done well... And if the universities won't voluntarily go down the University of Chicago line, well, maybe there is a role for the government to push them in that direction. So yeah. that so that's at least two things: the labour laws, yeah, laws about academic freedom that are meant to be supportive of academic freedom. Uh, preferably, uh, when I say laws, preferably rules coming from the universities themselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. What do you that, think those about are two things? But, what do you but, think about institutions? I don't know if you have anything like this um, in in Australia, but institutions like the American Association of University Professors, um, um, sorts of sort of bodies that that have a sort of a quasi uh, official uh, role. Um, Usually they wind up sort of advocating on behalf of faculty, um, against usually in America, it's usually against administration. Um, yeah. um, I don't know whether the dynamics are similar in Australia between administration and, 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 and faculty. Um, but in America, the AAUP sort of has, has traditionally sort of defended faculty against per, uh, um, Sort of encroachments on their on their prerogatives by a sort of an ever expanding administration, but do you think that inst- institutions like that could play a more active role and and have some things to do uh, about this? Yeah, look, I do think those sorts of organisations have a a role. It's not necessarily a role that you can trust them to carry out, because those sort of organisations are often themselves, uh, you're highly Filled with these political in certain ways, and I mean they may be more willing to defend some kinds of views than than others, right? I mean, I if I were if I were a um, a global warming denialist, and I wanted to you know, to express views, saying, well, you know. Uh, the amount of global warming going on is exaggerated and the extent that's happening, it's being caused by, I don't know, sunspots or something. It's not caused by, you know, by, um, human activity. I want to say all those kind of things and I get into trouble over it. I certainly would not trust any organization on the left to defend my right to say those things. Yeah. And of course, I'm worried about people saying those things because I think they're dangerous anyway, but I still believe that people should be allowed to say them. And so you, you get this, this question, you know, someone's in favour of freedom of speech, academic freedom, etc. But is it for all comers or is it only for people saying you're safe? Nice things. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where do you start drawing those kind of lines? Yeah. 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 Well, Russell, thank you so much. This was really interesting. And um, as on a personal level, um, I'm very glad to have finally gotten to engage with you in person after um, reading some, so much of your stuff and, and, uh, and writing reviews and stuff. It's been really nice to see you in person. Um, I hope you, uh, what do you, what do you have on deck? I mean, um, are you working on another book? Do you? I, I am. Working what is on your project? <laughs> Tell us about it, if whatever you I, can. Uh, look, I, I. Oh no! Look, I have a book on a completely different topic. That's a topic that's dear to my heart, and um, I did research on for my PhD, which is the topic of human enhancement. Right. Ah, now that is an interesting topic. Yeah. So I have a book coming out from one of the European academic presses later this year on the, the the question of radical enhancement. The, the what, what's called, the title? The, the title of the book is At the Dawn of a Great Transition, and the subtitle is The Question of Radical Enhancement. And when did you say it's coming out? Later this year. Um, plan so if somebody goes on Amazon, they may, see it or, they may see it already if they go on Amazon. Or, hey, I think uh, yeah. last I looked, it wasn't up on Amazon yet, but it, it, in theory, it will be available in October and seems to be moving on pretty efficiently at the publisher's end. So, so I'm, I'm working on just seeing that through publication. Uh, what I'm currently writing about, I'm writing a couple of book chapters, um, for, for other people's books that are about freedom of, of religion, toleration, those, those kinds of issues, which, uh, are kind of, I suppose, the substructural underpinning of a lot of what we've been talking about today, but I'll be looking much deeper into the history, which is why I'm so keen to start giving you a, a bit of a spurt about what happened in classical antiquity with Christianity taking us. Yeah, that's, that's been on my mind a lot lately, but as I say, we see these problems you know, in every period of history when a new ideology comes along with high stakes in you know, how it sees the world. So I'm working on, on that now as well. So what's the best way with people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, um, is it a website? Do, do, are you pretty active on Twitter? I mean, where if people are digging what you do and want to sort of 
see what's coming next? Where's the best place to, to look for you? Yeah, well, they can find me on Twitter. Just look, I'll well, just search under my name. I mean, I have this handle, Meta Magician, but just search under my name and I'm there. And, and I'm fairly active on Twitter. I have quite a few thousand followers by now. I've been fairly quiet on social media, though, so yeah, you, you're not going to find me as active as, as some people, but I am around. Um, I have a, a blog called Meta Magician and the Hellfire Club, which is a mouthful. That blog was quite popular at one stage, but it's, it's a bit defunct now, but there's a lot of, I think, good material there if people want to go back and see what, what my track record over the years, this is what I've been saying. But above all, read my books. Go to Amazon and find me. Absolutely. Well, that's number one. Um, is by tyranny of opinion right now. Um, um, because it's great. Um, Russell, thank you so much and take care. And of course, in today's times, stay well. You too. Pleasure to talk to you, Dan. Thank you very See much. You. Bye.